So welcome everybody to the second of today's talks. Um, it's a huge pleasure to have Inon Spinker who's speaking to us from Vancouver uh, and he's going to tell us a tale of two balloons. Okay, great. Thanks, Christina, for the invitation and the introduction. So uh, this is a joint work with uh, Omar Angel and Gora Bray. It's uh, based on, um, well, I guess motivated by, and, and based on a question uh, by Itai Binyamini, which was motivated by some, some uh, uh, his motivations came from some coalescing random walks. Uh, I'm not sure that eventually uh, there's a very close connection, but, but uh, that's some motivation to keep in mind, perhaps. Um, yeah, I don't know if the question is completely natural, but I think it's I think it's very nice and and uh, and it does uh, give rise to some uh, interesting uh, uh, tools. I know that this is a very uh, or mostly I guess discrete uh, seminar, uh, uh, combinatorics and things like that. I I also don't usually do continuous things, so um, we'll we'll go at this together. Um, but there is also a lot of a lot of combinatorial things in, in the background, and although I will uh, introduce things like in a continuous setting where it's just nicer to describe things, uh, there's no like tie breaking and things like that. Uh, you can also do this uh, completely uh, discreetly if you wish. Uh, but you see the pictures and things like that. It's kind of nicer to do it uh, in a continuous setting. Okay, so let me let me first uh, just uh, tell you what the model I'm talking about is. So, um, oh yeah, maybe I should also mention, uh, so a tale of two balloons, okay, so it's kind of a, um, a, a word play on, okay, there's a tale of two cities. Um, for us, it's, uh, we kind of had more in mind uh, something called a tale of five balloons, which is uh, an Israeli children's book um, about uh, a tale of five balloons, which uh, some of them pop, some of them uh, fly away and things like that. And, and these types of things will, will also come into play in this, in this uh, process here. Okay, so what is the process? So we have a metric space. Uh, for now, it's, uh, you can just imagine something general, uh, but if you want, you can just imagine like the Euclidean uh, plane or something like that. There's an initial set of points uh, shown here in this picture, uh, these six points, uh, this is pi. And um, what, what we do is we, we imagine that these points are, uh, the initial set of points are the centers of initially deflated balloons. And as time uh, progresses, these balloons inflate and they grow at a constant rate one. So they always grow um, symmetrically and they're always just balls. Uh, and at time t, all of them are just balls of radius t, okay, centered around the, the initial points. Uh, but there's, um, that there's this um, there's some interaction between them, specifically when two touch, they disappear. So, so after uh, in, in this in this picture here, after a small time, uh, all of the balloons will look like this. None of them have touched yet, so so everything is fine. And then uh, as time progresses, they continue growing. And then maybe at the next uh, time step, sorry about my my bad uh, <laughs> my bad uh, drawing, but. I, I hope you can forgive me. So at some point, uh, two balloons will eventually uh, uh, touch each other. So here in this picture, these two, uh, two on the bottom right. And what happens at that time is they they pop and disappear. So in other words, we just we just remove them from the process, and we continue. Okay. So now we we continue growing these balloons, and then uh, at, at some point in time, uh, maybe these two are going to touch. So then we remove them. Uh, in this in this picture, we're just left with two balloons, and they continue growing until they eventually pop. You know, if there's some other balloons outside of the picture, maybe they'll start coming from here. Maybe this balloon will hit this one before the the left uh, one hits the right one. So we don't see a full picture here, so it's hard to say what what will happen. But but, but this is the process. Okay, so um, one way one way to think about this. So there is this uh, visual thing that you can imagine that that the balloons are growing, and as and when they hit each other, they pop and disappear. But uh, perhaps more mathematically, you can just imagine that there's a uh, decreasing um, point process. So there's pi, which is pi naught. And then as time is increasing, we, we're just removing some of the points from the process as we imagine the balls growing and touching each other. But, but in some sense, nothing is really moving. It's just uh, that points are, are being removed from the process. Okay, I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that's kind of clear. Maybe I'll show you a simulation. 
um, of the process in, in the plane. Um, okay, so I hope everyone can see this. And there's just points here. This is the initial set of points. Um, let's run this. Okay, so uh, as time is going on, the, these points are um, getting larger. And the balloons are growing. The blue ones are the active ones, which haven't popped yet. The gray ones are the ones which have already popped and they're shown at the time where they popped. So it's kind of a history. Uh, and then at some point in time here, I switch uh, here. I've stopped showing the gray and I, I, uh, I zoom out of the picture. So it's still the same process. We're just zooming out so that the balloons always have the same radius and so that we can see uh, more of a picture. And you see that there might be some, uh, some like stationary picture at the end. And, and then you have this, uh, okay, nice surprise at the end. Okay, so sorry. Uh, let me let me keep that for later. So uh, this uh, this simulation uh, actually was is in a more specific setting. So what I simulated was an initial point process, which was um, which was a Poisson point process, um, which uh, which just means that uh, disjoint areas of space have an independent number of points. And in any specific uh, area of space, the number of points is distributed as a Poisson uh, var variable. So this is basically the continuous analog of just, um, you know, just if you had a graph and just choosing every vertex independently with some probability to be in your set. So this is the continuous analog. So it's just, it just, it's just kind of the most random thing you can do um, with, with the most independence. And uh, we'll be, in this talk, I'll, I'll talk about mostly about these uh, three, or I guess just about these three situations. Uh, the Euclidean space in any dimension. Um, so, um, so Poisson point processes have an intensity, which is kind of how, how, uh, um, how dense the points are. However, for the process that we care about, if you scale um, space and time, um, you can you can scale the intensity and change it, and eventually you get the exact same process up to perhaps a time change in in Euclidean space. So really, in Euclidean space, it doesn't matter what the intensity of the Poisson point process is. On the other hand, we'll talk also about the hyperbolic plane. So the hyperbolic plane uh, has a curvature parameter. So there's a curvature parameter and an intensity parameter for the Poisson point process, and again, by scaling, you can get rid of one of them but not of both. So there's still one real parameter to talk about. So you can either fix the intensity of the Poisson point process and imagine uh, the parameter being the curvature or fix the curvature and, and play with the intensity. But there is a, a parameter here and it's not obvious that the um, properties of the process don't depend on this parameter. Perhaps they do. And finally, I'll talk about regular trees, which um, of course, um, typically it's, uh, we think about a regular tree as a combinatorial structure, a discrete thing, and that's what I do as well. But here, again, just, just for the definition to, to be easier so that there's no issues of tie breaking and things like this, I'll, I'll turn it into a continuous space by, um, by imagining every edge, uh, by, by identifying every edge with uh, the interval 0, 1. And then when I talk about a Poisson point process, that means that the points live on the interval itself. And there's a random number of points on each interval, and they're located uh, independent uh, uniformly on the intervals. There might be one interval with one, one with two or three. There might be some with zero, and so forth. Okay, I should also say that um, in in the generality uh, that I introduced the process here on the left, it's not even obvious that the process is well defined, because um, as the process is as time progresses. At, at the first um, moment that, that, that you kind of turn time on, you're already gonna have infinitely many collisions occurring just in the first epsilon time. And then it's not clear that you can resolve the order in which they happened and, and things like this. So, but it's, it's not, not obvious that it's well-defined. And indeed you do need some assumptions on the initial um, set of points or, or the metric space um, in, uh, on, on this triplet, if you wish, or, or pair. Uh, some simple assumptions that I'll get to in a minute. For now, let me just mention that in, in all of these cases here that I, I, I introduced, that I said I'll talk about, uh, it will indeed be well-defined. So, so that won't be an issue. 
Okay, so these are the um, cases that we're going to talk about. Uh, and what what is the, um, so what is the basic question that uh, we can ask ourselves here? So, so the basic question that we will be interested in is that of recurrence or transients. Um, so what do I mean by this? I'll say that the process is recurrent. If every point in the, spa in, in, in the space that we're uh, considering is um, visited by, is visited infinitely often by a balloon. Okay, so what I mean is an unbounded set of times. So you, you, if you imagine the, the balloon's growing and you look at a specific point, there, there's a, a certain set of times where the point is covered by a balloon, by any balloon. And uh, if that set of times is unbounded, we'll say that the process is recurring. Balloons keep coming back and visiting the point. On the other hand, we'll call it transient if uh, every point is uh, visited only finitely often. So at some point in time, um, it's, it will stop be visited, the uh, balloons will stop covering it and will never cover it any time in the future. And, and it's, not, it's not clear that these two, that there's a dichotomy here. It's, in general, there's no, there's no reason to imagine that it's uh, this or the other. Um, and that's for reasons like um, things might not happen almost surely. Maybe, maybe there's no zero one uh, law. Maybe, maybe there's probability half of this and half of that. Or in a general space, maybe it depends on the point you're looking at. Uh, for, for our, in the Euclidean plane, hyperbolic plane, uh, you know, there's transitivity, so it's clear that every point has the same, uh, same kind of behavior. On a regular tree, maybe the center points and the vertices behave differently or something like that. So it's not obvious that there is a dichotomy, a priori, at least. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll show you guys the, this uh, simulation for the hyperbolic plane, um, and, then, and then we'll move on to the results. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the I'll, I'll use the Poincaré disk model for the hyperbolic plane. Um, so, uh, so these are the initial set of points, uh, all which have the same radius, uh, which is a little epsilon, right? So the ones in the center look a bit bigger, but that's just because of the hyperbolic nature of this. Um, and, and we do the exact same thing. So uh, the, the balloons grow at a constant rate. Again, it just looks like they have different radiuses radii, but they have the same radius. And when two touch each other, they pop. And in the picture, they're shown here in gray. The blue ones are the active ones. And here you can see that uh, it looks a bit different than in the Euclidean plane. It looks like it's like there aren't many um, active balloons at some point, or at least all of the active balloons are very close to the boundary, right? So they're Okay, this is the end. Of, oh, no, the simulation is still running. Okay, I think it stopped. So, um, so yeah, so, so it looks a bit different here. Uh, it it kind of looks like it's transient. Now, if you look at the center and you, it, it looks like at some point balloons, the active balloons are just not getting near the center any, anymore. Okay. Uh, any any questions maybe about the definition before I go on to the result? Okay, so if the process is clear, um, let me um, move on to the result. So so the main result is that uh, in the Euclidean um, space of whatever dimension. Uh, the process is always recurrent. Uh, we kind of got a, a hint of that in the, in the simulations. And in the hyperbolic plane, as I was just saying, it's always transient. And this is, again, no matter what the, the curvature parameter is. So as, as we said, there's this parameter in the hyperbolic um, setting. And it's not clear that uh, things don't depend on that, but, but the, it's always transient. And the same goes for the tree whatever the intensity and the, the degree of the tree is, it's always true. And in fact, we have a bit of uh, a bit more, uh, uh, I would say, I don't know if I, we should call it quantitative, but something more informative than this. 
Um, and for that, uh, I'll need uh, to give a definition. So um, let's uh, let's write pi sub t for the uh, process, the points, the collection of points, um, which are the centers of the balloons which are active at time t, which still haven't popped by time t. Uh, and let's write r sub t to be the distance from the origin uh, to the um, to the nearest center of a balloon that's active at time t. Okay, so if, if these are the balloons that are active at time t, so all of them have a radius t. And we have our origin here, so we just look at the distance to the closest balloon, we call that rt. Okay, so in other words, uh, what does this mean? This means that rt is less or equal than t uh, if and only if the origin is covered at time t. Okay, because the, the radius is t, so so it's covered at time t if, if the distance is at most t. And also, if you look at rt minus t, so, so what, is, what this means is that if you look at rt minus t, if it's lim inf is, uh, is, if it's lim inf say is minus infinity, that means that it, uh, it we're gonna be recurrent. And if it's lim inf is plus infinity, almost surely that means that we're going to be transient. Okay, so what we actually show here is that um, we know we can say something about this RT. Where, so instead of RT minus T, I'll look at RT over T, which is it's a bit coarser, uh, but, uh, but, but we'll, we'll say something much better than just whether RT minus T goes to infinity or, or minus infinity. So in, in the Euclidean space, RT over T almost surely goes to zero. In other words, RT grows sub, well, okay, not that it grows sublinearly, but the lim inf. So there is a sub sublinear sequence. So there's for any epsilon, there's infinitely many times where RT is less than epsilon T. Because if we, if we think about what this means in, in this picture here, that means that not only is the origin covered infinitely often, but actually it gets arbitrarily close to the center of, of the balloons infinitely often relative to their size. So at time T they have size T and we will be epsilon T close to the center for any epsilon infinitely often. Okay, so, so really we get very close to the centers of balloon relative to their size. And again, we saw, we saw a bit of that in the simulation. On the other hand, in the hyperbolic plane, uh, so we get this lower bound here, uh, which is uh, 1.44. Uh, and, and the important thing for, uh, for transients is just that this number is greater than one, because that would mean that RT minus T goes, the limit of is, is plus infinity. Uh, but this again tells us a bit more. It tells us that um, that not only is the origin not covered infinitely often, or just for a bounded set of times, but actually the closest ball gets um, it, its distance is is not is 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 at least one point four four t at time t. Okay, so so the the balls don't even uh, get close to covering the origin. Right, it's an, and again, we saw that in the picture that as time progressed, they were kind of being pushed closer and closer to the boundary. And in the in the regular tree, we also um, showed that it's uh, transient, as as I said before. But we actually know that the limit is exactly two. Okay, so we so we know exactly what what the uh, closest ball is at time t. Okay, and this too, uh, this too has some some. Uh, some me special meaning, um, which I'll get to uh, in a minute, or in a few minutes. Okay, so that that's the result that I, I'd like to tell you about. Uh, let me give you a bit about a bit of background uh, about this process, including how to um, how to see that it's well defined. So, uh, so um, okay, what do we need for the process to be well defined, or at least sufficient conditions? Uh, this was studied uh, in, in a paper by Holvery, Pimentel, Pearson, and Schramm uh, called Poisson Matching. Uh, they, they looked at um, uh, not the balloon process, but a very, very closely related thing, uh, which we'll get to in a, in a, in a minute. They, they looked at it on RD, but, but really um, everything they, or at least this, this, uh, this uh, statement that they showed is, is not hard to, to generalize. So if the point process that you start with is discrete, 
meaning that uh, there's no accumulation point. Um, no two pair of points have uh, are, are at equal distance. So all distances between points are distinct. That's in order for there to be no issues of tie breaking so that, so that two things never collide at the same time. So that things always occur at, uh, at uh, distinct times. That, that was also the issue that I was discussing. If you'd like to do this uh, in discrete uh, time or discrete space, you have to uh, break ties in some manner. So, so here, we're just assuming that, that that's not an issue. And uh, the, main, uh, the main point here is this uh, no descending chains. So what is a descending chain? A descending chain is a sequence of points where the consecutive distances are, are decreasing. Okay, so, um, so that would mean in particular that there would uh, also be uh, an accumulation point. Well, uh, okay, that's if it was decreasing to zero at least. Um, okay, so why do we not want something like this? The reason we don't want something like this is that if we ask ourselves, did this uh, this first point on the left collide with the second one on the right, on the second dot from the left, that depends on whether the second on the left survived up until this time, this radius, right? Whatever this T here is. But to, to decide that, you have to know if this second point collided in a, at a previous time with the third point. And to know that, you have to know if the third point collided with the fourth point. Because if the third point collided with the fourth point, then the third point wasn't there to collide with the second one. Right, so, so there's this um, kind of recursive thing that you have to um, go through. And if there's an infinite descending chain, you can never decide what happened. And then the process wouldn't, wouldn't be defined. But if, if all of these pro pro uh, properties are satisfied, then, then uh, this uh, process is well defined. And, uh, and the fact that a Poisson prone process satisfy the, satisfies these three properties almost surely, this was uh, shown by Hexstrom and Meester uh, in, in the Euclidean space, and, 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 and the, the ideas all generalized to, to, let's say, reasonable spaces, including all the ones that we're discussing here. So hyperbolic plane and trees and things like that. So this is something pretty, pretty robust. Okay, so that, that, that's for the process being well defined. Uh, maybe maybe I should say before I move it onto the stable matching. Yeah, maybe I should say before I move onto the stable matching, just to, uh, to to stress this point that I was saying with the infinite descending chain. So if you have a collection of points, then you can imagine the balls growing and uh, and colliding with each other. So. Uh, so again, if, if there's no infinite descending chain, what you can do, the way that you can um, uh, describe this process, um, you know what, let me, let, me, let me wait with this for just one second. Let me, let me say something about stable matching here. Let, let, let me postpone this for a minute. Okay. So, um, so there's a relation um, to stable matchings, and I'll just uh, quickly recall uh, what, what stable matchings are. So in, in the classical setting, this is uh, the so-called marriage problem. So we have two, uh, uh, two uh, sets of, uh, of, of, of individuals, say, uh, let's say men and women, and we want to uh, consider uh, matchings between them. So every man is matched to a woman and every woman is matched to a man. So we want to talk about uh, perfect matchings. And a matching like this is, uh, okay, and, 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 and we're given in, so the assumption is that every individual has a um, preference order, a ranking on the individuals in the other group. So every man uh, ranks the women, every woman ranks the man, has, has some preference on, on, um, on who they prefer. And a matching is unstable if there exists a, a, a man and a woman, okay, let's say this man and this woman, which are currently unmatched, okay, but uh, which each of, each of whom would prefer to be matched with the other over their current, um, their current partner. Okay, so if this guy, if this one's A and this is, uh, and this is B and this is, a prime, which is the current partner of B, and this is B prime, which is the current partner of A, 
then if A prefers B over B prime, and B prefers A over A prime, so each one prefers the other over their current partner, then, pr then this is unstable because presumably they would, uh, uh, you know, they would divorce their current partners and just go off to each other, right, and marry each other. So, so, so this is un an unstable situation. But if either of them uh, prefers their current partner, then then it's at least locally stable. Okay, so okay, so a stable matching is a, is a matching in which there does not exist any such unstable pair. And uh, Gale and Shapley back in '62 they studied these and they showed that stable matchings always exist uh, in a very general in, in this general completely general setting. Whatever the pre preference orders are, you can always find the stable matching. Uh, however, the stable matching doesn't have to be unique. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Now, in our situation, the, uh, this, uh, the, re the relation to our setting is, is not, in the, not exactly in this classical setting of stable uh, matchings, but in, in, a, in a different setting, which is uh, the so-called roommate problem, uh, where things are very similar, but instead of having two, uh, two groups of individuals, we just have one group of uh, homogeneous individuals. Okay, so so this is uh, it's called uh, the roommate problem, and each one, each individual has a, a ranking of all the other individuals, and we're trying to do the exact same thing. So again, an unstable mat, an unstable pair is a pair of two individuals which are currently unmatched, but but each they they each prefer each other over their current match. Okay, and we'll we'll take a population of even size so that you know there are perfect matchings. However, in this in this scenario, it's not true in general that for any preference uh, for any rank rankings uh, or preference list that there is a stable matching. So you might not have stable matchings in this setting. Okay, so why is this a bit more a, a bit closer to our situation? Let me now say that uh, our situation is even more specialized. So in our situation, we, we have a homogeneous population. However, the, we're in a metric setting where the ranks are not just arbitrary, but they're according to the distance. Okay, so every point, it ranks all of the other points according to the distances. So it prefers the one closest to it because that's the one it's, it's, it's going to uh, um, pop with, it's going to try to pop with, in, in, initially, and then the next one is the next um, candidate to pop with and, and so forth. So the, the orders are, the ranking is just according to distance. And in this setting, um, actually, um, forward Paris Perment on Tram, they show that in, in this setting, the, the three conditions that I described earlier, uh, these three conditions, they indeed hold, um, or sorry, if, if these three conditions hold, then there exists a unique stable matching. Um, and furthermore, this unique stable matching is generated by a greedy algorithm. So what do I mean by this? Uh, and this is what I wanted to say earlier, so uh, no, I'll say this now. So if we have a set of uh, points, um, the greedy algorithm, what it, what it does is it finds any, any two points which have the property that they are mutually closest to each other. In other words, that uh, the first point its closest point is the second point, and the second point, its closest point is the first point. And it just matches those two to each other and then removes them from the process and continues, finds another pair of points which are mutually closest, matches them and removes them and continues. So that's the uh, greedy algorithm, and that generates this unique stable matching. And how is this, uh, and now we can see how this is related to um, very closely related to our Berlin process. It's just because this uh, this greedy algorithm exactly describes the um, who are the who are the balloons which are going to pop with each other, right? Because the the first pair of balloons which are going to pop with each other are those which are mutually closest to each other. They'll they'll meet each other before they meet anyone else. They'll pop and be removed, and then we just continue. So um, this um. Sorry, these, these should be touching. So, so this exactly describes this uh, situation. If I go back to the picture at the very beginning, okay, perhaps this is a bit too small to see. Uh, maybe let's look here. You, you see these, um, 
these uh, line segments here. So this is exactly the um, this um, the unique stable matching, which describes which two popped with 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 each other. Okay, so the fact that there exists a unique a unique stable matching is exactly equivalent to um, the balloon process being well defined, because we can describe which two balloons pop with each other, and 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 that's all we need to to describe the process. Okay, yeah, and 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 maybe I'll just uh, recall that as I said, the the Poisson process has these three properties almost really. Okay, so so in in the setting that we're talking about, everything is well defined. Okay, so the last thing I want to say here for, for about the background uh, before I continue on to the proofs is um, is to tell you um, just one result from this uh, paper um, by Howard Pimentel, Paris, and Tram. So they they study um, uh, matchings of Poisson processes and RD. Uh, they study various types of matching, not just the stable matching, but but I'll just mention the stable matching here because because that's the one that's uh, relevant uh, to our to our situation, uh, the stable matching. This is what describes uh, the, the balloon process. And uh, one result that uh, they talk about, um, described in, in the terminology that I gave. So if we talk, so it's basically talking about the density of the, of the points that are still active at time t, which still haven't popped. Okay, so, so let's imagine that the initial point process has density one. So it's a, Poisson process of intensity one. What that means that it is that if you take a, um, say a, a one by one box, one by one by one box, so a, a box which has area one, then on average the, the expected number of points in that box is one to begin with. But as time moves forward, points are being removed because balloons are, are popping. So the density of pi t is decreasing. And we'd like to get a good estimate on the density. So here's a trivial upper bound. Uh, the density, so, since distances in pi t are at least 2t, because any any point in in pi t, mean, that means that if you put a ball of radius t around it, then those balls have to be disjoint because the balloons still haven't touched each other. So just, just the fact that, that those balls are disjoint means that the density is at most one over the volume of a ball of radius t. Okay, so this is um, uh, like a, a constant over t to the d. In, in Euclidean space. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just mention here already, uh, just to say that at what the fact that the density behaves like a constant over t to the d, that this we don't know. This, this is still open. So we just have it as an upper bound. Um, however, what, what they show is that almost surely the limb inf of rt minus 2t is, um, is less or equal than zero. Uh, and what this means is that, okay, so if, if we think about this in a bit more, and, and as RT over T means that it's at most two, and that, that's where this two that I mentioned earlier is relevant. So what this means is that, what does it mean for RT to be 2T? It means that at time T where the radius of the balloon is T, the distance is 2T. So it means that, that you reach halfway, right? You, you're not really close, you're not very far, you're exactly halfway, half, half the distance. Okay, so if this is the origin and th this is a balloon um, and it's, uh, so, so if the distance here is RT, if that's rough, suppose it's roughly 2T and this thing is T, so you reach halfway to the origin. So what this uh, general proposition is telling us is that we, we have kind of for free, or at least from, uh, from previous results, that uh, infinitely often balloons will reach halfway to the to the origin. Um, and, and this is a very soft uh, soft argument. It uses some insertion deletion tolerance and some ergodicity, and 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 uh, and this uh, these arguments um, are not hard to extend again to the general uh, settings that we're talking about. So they, they this also applies to the hyperbolic space and to trees. So this upper bound of two is always is always true. So if we go back to the result here, okay, so in general, we know that this is at most two, that this is at most two, and this is at most two, sorry. But this one is at most two. 
Okay, and, and, and what our result is saying here is that on the tree, it's exactly two, if that's tight. On the hyperbolic plane, we don't know it's tight, but we do get a, a lower bound, which is greater than one. And an RD, even though it's at most two, is actually zero. Okay, so this initial input, while it's, while it's very useful, is it doesn't get us all the way to deciding whether something is recurrent or transient, because uh, the, the critical threshold for that is one, is whether it's greater or equal than one. Okay, so let me let me tell you a bit about the proofs now. Uh, so let's start with RD. So in RD, we want to show that the process is uh, recurrent. And in RD, it, it's it's a, it's a funny thing. Um, uh, our our proof is is very soft in RD, and it, and somehow in RD we are able to boost this upper bound of two to zero. But again, that part is not true in general. So that, that's something specific for RD. So um, let's define T sub X to be the, um, the time when the balloon at, uh, at uh, centered at X pops. Okay. In other words, it's radius at the time that it popped. So on the same thing. So this proposition tells us that the limb soup of Tx over the norm of x is at least a half, uh, right? Because if balloons reach halfway to the origin, if this uh, if this is the origin and this is x, uh, then what this means is that Tx is at least um, norm of x over two, right? Because um, whenever it popped, it, it it popped at some time after after half the distance, so after after time x over two. Okay, and it's, it's not that every balloon does that, but there are infinitely many balloons with that property because the limb inf is at, is at most two. So, so just uh, this is like just inverting it. The limb soup is uh, of t x over x is at least a half. Okay, and here's the the, the soft the soft uh, result which allows us to boost uh, this two to zero or this half to infinity. Okay. So the theorem says that any stationary process you have indexed uh, by ZD, uh, its limb soup of uh, xn over norm of n has to be either zero or infinity. Okay, it can't it can't just be some finite number. Okay, so before before describing the proof of that, how do we finish? So uh, we know that the limb soup is at least a half an hour situation, so it has to be infinite. And then going back to the RT, just like the two was a half, the infinite is zero. So, right, because we'll, we'll find balloons where the time that they popped is like a million times their norm. So that means that uh, if, this is, uh, if this is the origin and this is X, then uh, the, you know, the balloon is just way bigger than. So, so, so this is like RT over T having a limit of zero. Okay, so what's the idea behind uh, the proof of this proposition? Um, just in a few words, I, I don't want to, to go over this uh, too much, but um, if we assume that the process is ergodic, which we can assume, um, it, so if we, if we show this for ergodic processes, that each ergodic process is either zero or infinite, then any stationary process is zero or infinite, but, but it's not a constant. It might be you know, probability one third this, probability two third that but that we don't care about here. So if we assume that it's ergodic, what we want to show is that it's either almost surely zero or almost surely infinite. And let's suppose that it's, uh, it's, it's greater than some uh, number A with positive probability. Basically what that means, that the limb soup of Xn over N is at least A, it means that if you put a tree of height Xn at, at the point N, then standing from the origin, if you, if you just imagine uh, looking, say, towards the right, if you look at a slope of A, then you'll see infinitely many trees, like canopies above that, above that, that. Um... Sorry, what is Tx, Tx? So Tx here is in our situation, in the balloon situation, it's this, it's the time at which the balloon popped. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I guess formally to apply the, the theorem because it's indexed by ZD, you have to apply it to the, you know, you take a small ball, uh, a small box 
um, like a one by one box where the bottom left corner is uh, indexed by ZD and you look at the maximum of TX on, in that box. But that, that's just uh, the technical. Okay, so, um, so if we look at slope A, then we'll see infinitely many uh, of these uh, accents which are above that height. Now by translation variance, the same thing is true for starting looking from any point. So if we look from this point and we put a, a slope A, we'll see infinitely many trees above it. And if we look from here, we'll see infinitely many trees above it. And, and basically now, so, okay, so, and so saying this uh, differently, if you, if at every tree canopy, you uh, look at the um, pyramid of uh, slope A, starting from that, then these uh, collection of, of, of um, the bases, which are just segments in one dimension, those segments are going to cover the whole real line infinitely, infinitely often. That's, that's um, uh, kind of the same thing. So if we draw this in two dimensions where the bases of these pyramids are circles, right? so now this is a picture from above in two dimensions. Right? So imagine that there's a pyramid like this in two dimensions. So thinking about it from above, the bases are circles. So these um, are not circles, I guess, uh, um, uh, balls, disks. So these disks cover the plane um, everywhere. And if you apply a, a Vitali covering lemma type thing, it tells you that you can find disjoint balls, so these uh, darker ones here, such that if you blow them up, uh, say by, by a five times factor, you're you're going to cover everything. But the fact that they were disjoint means that you can. Um, so the fact that their blow up covers everything, but that they were originally disjoint means that they're they originally. Um, or say they're two times blow down covers a positive proportion of space. And, and what we're using here about RD is just uh, like a, a volume doubling property. That if you, if you take a ball and you multiply your, it, its radius by 10 or divide its radius by 10, then the area just changes by a, um, a constant factor, right? So it's like um, a constant to the D or something like that. Okay, and, and that property is not true on, on trees and on a hyperbolic plane. So that, that's really what we're using here about RD. Okay, so from this, you get that the loom super has to be at least 2a, actually, because we shrink the, these uh, spaces by a factor of two. Um, and shrinking by a factor of two is kind of like making the slope increase by a factor of two. Okay, so uh, I, I hope that, that gives you some idea. By the way, um, when should I um, finish? Um, if you can go till 55 or something like that, just to leave a bit of time for questions at the end. But... Okay, all right, sure. So, so maybe maybe I'll just uh, spend the, this next time uh, talking about the tree. Maybe, maybe perhaps we'll just skip the hyperbolic plane. Let, let's see how it goes. Okay, so so let's talk about the tree now. And here here really there's even there's more common talk combinatorial things coming into play. So as we said, the deregular tree, you can think about it as a graph. I'll think about it as a continuous space just so that uh, I, I don't have to uh, redefine this, um, like the tie breaking and things like that. If the balloons lived on the on the vertices, then then you could have a simultaneous uh, collision. So, so just to avoid that, let's, let's uh, keep things continuous. But in fact, you'll see already in the proof, the first step is just to project everything to the vertices. Okay, so, so the, continu the continuous thing was just so that the process is well defined, but the analysis is really discrete. So, so what do I mean by project? I just mean, let's look at the collection of vertices uh, for which there is, um, there is a, a, an active ball, a, a center of an active balloon um, you know, within distance half. So this guy I send here, this guy I send there, this goes here, this is also projected to here. Um, but maybe this guy does this guy doesn't have a point around it since there's no one uh, there's no one in in the around it. okay, so I just project everything to the nearest vertex. Okay, let's call this pi tilde t. Now here's two two properties of this pi tilde t. First of all, it's um 
2t minus 1 separated. Uh, what do I mean by that? So in pi t, of course, the distances were at least 2t, because as we said before, um, the balls of rad the balloons have radius t and they're disjoint. Okay, so minus 1 just because we projected. So things moved by, uh, you know, so, so this could have moved by a half, and this could have moved by a half. So, so maybe now the distances are 2t minus 1. Okay, but we get a, a subset of the tree, of the vertices of the tree, which has the property that any two vertices in the subset have distance at least 2t minus 1. And, and moreover, it's a factor of IID, which basically means that you can describe the, this, this uh, set, the set of vertices, by putting IID variables on the vertices and, um, and just describing some function, which is translation variant, which tells you how to say whether a vertex is in the set or not. Okay, so I, I won't I won't give more details of that, but that that really is uh, just you just um yeah, you think about it a bit and you 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 can see that. Uh, so here's a question: What is the maximal density of a process uh, X with these two properties? Okay, so again we have this trivial um, bound, which just takes into account this first property, the fact that the balls of radius t minus a half or something like that, so t or t minus a half are disjoint means that, uh, that the, the density is at most one over the volume of a ball radius t or t minus a half. The half isn't so important here. Okay, so it's like one over d minus one to the power t. Um, however, this second property uh, actually allows us to boost this to roughly a ball of radius 2t. We, we kind of get this extra uh, factor of two for free. So the theorem says that the density of a process satisfying both of these properties is at most a constant times t over d minus one to the two t, okay, which is basically like one over the volume of a ball radius two t. Uh, and, and this, uh, I'll, I'll say in a, in, a, in a minute how this goes. Um, and this is really combinatorial. So there's a previous result about independent sets. So independent sets are like one separated sets or two separated sets, depending how you define that, right? Where things have to be, you can't take adjacent vertices. So, so I guess distance two, at least. Uh, so Bolabash and McKay um, um, proved um, this exact result for t equals, I guess, one or two, something like that. But, okay, so you, one, once, you, um, once you do the correct translation, and then uh, more recently, Raman, Raman and Virag um, proved this theorem. So for the factor of IID situation, um, also for uh, independent sets. Uh, and they, they got the, the correct constant. So that, that's what they did. Um, OK, let me skip this. So let me just tell you um, about the proof ID, huh? Uh, and this proof idea is basically basically the same outline of the proof that Bolabash uses. So uh, what we do is we approximate this factor by a block factor, which is a, just a finite range map. So what that means is every vertex on the tree just looks at a big ball around it, maybe a ball of radius 100, look, looks at the um, IID, the, the, the random values, and, and applies some algorithm to decide whether uh, the vertex uh, belongs to this uh, set or not. Okay, and now you're going to introduce some error because you're approximating, but but basically you're not going to change the density by much. You can do a, you can make a good approximation if you choose this this finite range, this 100 to be large enough. Uh, the second uh, ingredient is to use uh, this uh, very combinatorial fact that random deregular graphs. So if you choose a random deregular graph, say in the configuration model. It converges locally to a deregular tree. So this is just a basic computation that uh, that uh, you don't have small cycles, and so you start seeing um, locally you see something that looks like a, a regular tree. And what we eventually need is an extension of this to a colored configuration model. So instead of every vertex having the d half edges emanating from it, and then you choose a uniform matching, uh, there's d half edges, but each half edge has a distinct color. So there's there's D colors and every edge has that. And then when you choose the matching, you have to match uh, half edges with the same of same colors to each other. And then uh, the same type of arguments show that this can 
so again you don't have um small cycles that that's a similar proof and then it converges locally to a colored tree so so we need that for some uh for, for this uh, second point that i uh skipped over uh anyways what you do after you have that is you can you can uh, pull this whole infinite setting to a finite setting which is really completely combinatorial so this uh, block factor that i was describing this finite range map you can now apply it on the finite graph so you have a finite uh, random, say, deregular graph. You know that locally there's no small cycles. So if you have an algorithm that works on that uh, that works whenever you locally see a a tree, a deregular tree of uh, of height 100, then you can apply it at most vertices on the finite graph because at most vertices there are no small cycles. So then you can uh, you you get this um, local algorithm on the finite tree. So, so this is also a big branch uh, that's been studied in uh, combinatorics and uh, computer science. This is this, uh, these notions of local algorithms, and 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 then once you're on this uh, finite setting, now it's um, this is just the usual things that you would do in in um, for finite random regular graphs. You can try to bound the size of a largest t separate two t separated set. So this, you just apply some combinatorial techniques. You really just uh, count. You, 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 yeah, you just do some counting arguments. You get a good bound on the probability that a specific set is eventually 2T separated. Uh, and you get a bound which is good enough so that you can just apply a union bound on, on the number of sets of that size. And, and you just see that um, just by this union bound, uh, you, you see that there are no 2T separated sets of size greater than something. And that translates to a density bound on, on the largest uh, two T separated set. Okay, so that that that's uh that's basically the proof of this of uh, of this sorry of this theorem here of this theorem here. And once you have that, uh, let's uh, go back to the balloons and see how how we get the result. So this theorem that I just stated tells us that the density of this um, projected um, point process uh, has density at most constant t over d minus one to the two t. Um, now, if we take a ball of radius almost two t, if we take a ball of radius two t minus um, some large constant log t, that ball in the tree has size so that you can just compute. It has size something like d minus one to the two t uh, divided by like t to the power three or something because of this log. And then, that, and then if you just use the density with uh, the size of the ball, so a union bound tells you that the probability that you find a point in this process within distance less than this is at most one over two t squared. So that, that's just the union bound. And once you have that, you can apply a Borel Contelli because this is summable um, to say that uh, to get that. That almost surely RT is never going to be less than this thing uh, because this is summable. So that tells you that um, so if you divide by by T now, you get that the limit of RT over T is at least two. And we and remember we knew that what it was at most two by this general, we had this general uh, this general statement that said that it's at most two, so we get that it equals two. And that's what the, the theorem was saying. Okay, so I think I won't uh, I won't say anything about the hyperbolic plane, perhaps other than the fact that really what we do is we embed a three regular tree in a in a in a nice manner inside the hyperbolic plane. So you can see it in this picture here, and then basically we convert the question of, on the hyperbolic plane to a question on the three regular tree, which we already knew, which we already proved, and this conversion the approximation loses a bit in in, in in the process, and that's why we don't get the two at the end, and we just get some uh, some other number that comes from uh, these hyperbolic computations. So we get this 1.44, and it, it's somewhat, I, I feel like it's somewhat lucky that this number was greater than one. I mean, it could have been less than one, and then we would have been stuck, but uh, I, we got lucky here, I think. Okay, so I'll stop here and maybe leave you just with some open questions to, to look at. So thank you. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk, you know.
Um, so there was one talk that came up, uh, one question that came up in the chat, but I think you've actually just put it on your slide as an open problem. <laughs> um, oh. David was asking, um, do you think the actual limit will also be two for the hyperbolic plane? Um, so that's, I guess, your fourth question. <laughs> Right. Uh, I guess I, I didn't indicate whether I think it is or not uh, completely, but uh, but yeah, I, I I think it would be. It's, it's hard hard to see why it wouldn't be. Yeah, could it maybe help to embed trees, regular trees, which are have a bigger degree of free into it, or does it not play a role? Uh, we tried that, and um, if I remember correctly, it actually gets worse uh, as as you increase the degree. Um, it either stays the same or, or gets worse, some, one of the two. So, so you probably would need to do something better than just comparing to trees. Um, one, one thing that we were thinking, uh, we, we don't know how to do this, but is, so for trees, what we did is uh, we found a finite, a finite model which converges to the tree. So that's just the configuration model, a random deregular graph. And there might be some analogs for that in the hyperbolic setting. There might be like a finite hyperbolic model, which converges locally to the hyperbolic plane. And in the finite model, maybe you can do some computations, uh, but we, we haven't been able to do that. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, I've actually got two questions. In the trees, does it really matter that they're regular? It looks like we consider some much larger class of trees, like more than 18 degrees, or maybe even some quite big class. Um, okay, uh, that's a nice question, let me think. So, okay, so first of all, there's the issue of, um, okay, so you definitely you want it to be. I'm sure that the proof will need that it's um you know that it still has like an exponential growth. You yeah. can't you can't give me like a Z or something like that, right? Uh, and um, so if you want to get the two, So for the two, I, I'm I'm sure that there's a that, that you can do something for general trees. I'm just not sure how how general it would be. So if we go back here, let's look at what happened. We had this um, two t minus omega. So so here we used something at least in this proof about you know the sizes of the trees and uh, of balls and things like that. And maybe even more importantly, uh, this thing. Yeah, maybe maybe that's maybe that's the issue that. Um, that, that this this um that this theorem okay so if you just talk about two t one two t minus one separate let's let let me forget the minus one so two t separated sets what's the best uh, the highest density two t separated set on the tree it it actually has density uh, exactly one over the volume of ball radius t because you can do it greedily you can just put a point look at all of the things it excludes put another point. But that construction is definitely not going to be a factor of IID. Another, so a factor of IID for those who, who don't like that term or aren't familiar with it, in the finite setting, what it means is that there's a local algorithm. Now, if you talk about general trees, I don't know, like this issue of local algorithm uses something about transitivity. The fact that you're applying the same algorithm everywhere. So I'm not sure what the analog of that would be and how to, um, prove a theorem which tells you that although for separate just just using separated you get this bound the fact that it's somehow um the same everywhere actually gives you a much better bound that was the crucial uh, thing that we we did here on the tree so, so that i'm not sure how to do on, on a general tree yeah, yeah i don't want to expect it to work maybe in general trees but in some quite big laws that you know Okay. The, other, the other question was, do you think there might be examples where the limit of this ratio is not zero or two? Um, <laughs> okay, uh, nice. another nice question. Let me say for reasonable spaces, uh -huh. um, you know, if you take like a quasi-transitive tree or something like that, I, I still think it would be two. I, that's my initial guess, but I, I, I don't have a good uh, good reason to think that. 
okay, and the reasonable spaces with sort of polynomial growth, then it should be zero, like, like the like in the deep. So can you say that again? And, and the other, and for things which are sort of don't have exponential growth, it ought to be zero, like, like in the D. Yeah, so one thing that we're not completely certain about is if the, if, if the, um, what differentiates zero and two, or let's say greater than one, whether it's the exponential growth or the non amenability, right? Because RD is both, uh, has polynomial growth and is amenable, and these two are both non, non amenable and have exponential growth. So it's, it's not clear uh, which of those two things um, are the actual, um, actually make the, make the difference. But, uh, but let's say if you take something of polynomial growth, then yeah, it's probably zero. And if you take something, um, um non-amenable then right. it's probably right. yeah mm -hmm. yeah Any um, questions? have you thought about your process on finite well graphs or rather metric spaces okay so on finite graphs we haven't thought about it there's the the basic question has to change of course of recurrence or transients because on the finite graph uh, if there's an even number of uh, things to begin with, then everything will disappear. And if there's an odd number, then one will survive. So uh, I guess one question could be, how long does it take for all of them to disappear or for the last one too, if it's odd? And, and, and that, yeah, that we don't know even maybe on, if on kind of simple, I, I, think, I think even on a cycle. So if you take a circle, okay, and you just put uh, some points, I, I don't think we have, um, any idea how long it's going to take for for these two for the last point to disappear yeah um because it, it's a bit tricky because uh yeah but but this is uh this is a nice thing to think about right if you have something like this for example then uh so there's five points down here and one at the top and they're more or less antipodal so the four of these are going to disappear very quickly at the bottom and then the last one with the top one is going to take like um, time half, right? If if the I guess if the arc length here is one or two or something, right? But then if uh, if if it, even one of these points moves somewhere, it can completely change the whole picture because of this issue of it's kind of chaotic because if one almost if one is on the verge of uh, of, of popping with another and then you move it a bit, it can change the whole order of everything. So yeah, we don't we don't know. Anyone? Also, as a side, side remark, you could have gone also for 99 balloons um, in, in German <laughs> in reference to a famous pop song. <laughs> yeah. Great. I think we seem to have exhausted everybody's questions. So let me just um, stop recording. Yeah.